I'll try that again. Good morning, St. Patrick. Welcome to worship. We're glad to have you uh, with the family this morning. A few announcements as we get started. Uh, we are having a women's retreat February 4th through 5th at the Country Place. Uh, if you'd like to register for that, uh, you can do that online or via the Church Center app. Uh, there's a QR code on the back of your bulletin that you can uh, use to get where you need to go there. Uh, also, if you're a guest with us, we have a Newcomers Feast coming up on January 23rd. That's just an opportunity for you to get to know us a little bit better and for us to get to know you as well. Uh, there will be uh, uh, fried chicken and uh, child care, and we would love to have you with us. Uh, let's take just a few moments to prepare our hearts for worship this morning. Please join me in this opening prayer. Lord of creation, bless this liturgy, our worshipful work. Fill the forms to fit our hearts for heaven. Breathe your spirit into word, sacrament, and prayer that we might be renewed in your image and bring glory to your name. Amen. Do you stand and sing? Stand up and bless the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. You are the Lord, you alone. 
You have made the heaven, heaven of heavens with all of their hosts and the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. And you preserve all of them and the host of heaven worships you. Let us love and sing and wonder. Let us praise the Savior's name. He has hushed the laws that thunder. He has quenched Mount Sinai's flame. He has washed us with his blood. He has washed us with his blood. He has washed us.
God, we lift up our weary hearts to you this morning. It is right and good to do so. You are the maker and the keeper of heaven and earth, of things we see and of those that remain hidden from us. We are and have always been a broken people, longing for a place on earth to call our home, where we know and are known completely, where heaven could be made local for us. Even for those who have never left a place, never lost a love, still there is the sense within us that there is a finality of belonging yet to be felt. The eyes of humanity forever search the horizon for better and more enduring life. And you have met us here in our wandering. Life eternal and abundant has come to us. So we pray that you would send your spirit to protect us this morning from a, a small view of this life, from a suspicion toward your goodness and the power you have to turn everything for our good and your glory. No weapon formed against us will prosper. No wickedness is secret from your sight. You who order the stars and their spheres have no trouble telling darkness to flee and death to surrender its keep. You alone are attuned to our every need and eager to protect and provide for us. You know the silent cries of our hearts and you will not let any wound remain unhealed. All of creation will fall to its knees before you. And those whom you have called beloved will have justice and mercy forever. And because of this, we, your elect exiles, have been freed and called to be kind, to be a comfort, to bind up the brokenhearted and deliver the captives from their bondage. We are free and called to welcome the stranger and care for the widow 
and the orphan, to keep setting tables of God's grace for the lonely. We are free and called to tell a better story than this world can imagine or hope for, one where God himself has become our dwelling place. So remake us in the image of your word made flesh to dwell among us. Let us echo his works as we join in those words which he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated as our ushers come and collect tithes and offerings and we contemplate the many ways we can be generous as we receive an offering in song. I'm mm-hmm. 
stand as we join the church historic in the affirmation of the Apostles Creed. Christians, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into The third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Well, again, good morning. Welcome to St. Patrick. Uh, I made a few announcements at the beginning of the service events that are going on in the next few weeks. You can find details for those uh, on our website. You can click the, the QR link or on the Church Center app. If you need help getting plugged into those um, digital means, uh, come and see me at the Connect table uh, after the service, and I would love to help you with that. Amen. And now as we continue our worship, we do confess when we turn to the Scripture that vain is the hope of man, vain is the wisdom of man, so we'll look at God's Word together. If you have a Bible, we'll be in uh, Ezra 3. Ezra 3. Praise and lament, we're always somewhere between praise and lament. And the one thing that the gospel demands of us and the people of God is honesty, and that's why to share this news as painful as it is, because the gospel is always protecting the lost, the least, the lonely, the lame. And believe me, we all have loss in this. Even if you think you don't, you do. Because even though you're not directly affected, leadership at times like these is utterly called into question. People have been traumatized. Old wounds are open. And because things can only move at the speed of trust, we have great loss. And that's why we grieve together. That's why we grieve together. We know that healing takes a long time. Lots to rebuild, and in God's good providence, that's what we're looking at in Ezra today. A group of people, and get this, a group of God's ancient people who had lost a lot, and who had never seen the land, never seen the temple, 
have sort of, were, were sort of there because they inherited the trouble of their parents. And they make their way back to the land. And, and the wise leaders among God's ancient people knew that there was a way to rebuild. A way to rebuild faith in God, faith in their leaders, faith in each other, faith in the community. And so we're going to look at this today. Sometimes you have to create text. Sometimes God just gives you the text. And it's just in the liturgy. It's just in the planning. So let me just remind you of the context uh, that we're looking at here today. Uh, this community has returned because the stirrings of God in their heart. Uh, the heart of a pagan king, Cyrus, to be exact. He was an enlightened despot. And while the ruler before him was one of subjugation, his was to return people back to their land, empower the local gods, return and rebuild. That was his edict. And then God had to stir in the hearts of 50,000 of his people who have been in long enough in Babylon in a strange land to begin to rebuild a life. And some of them had even risen to the top of the governmental powers and had important positions so they are literally, God has to stir their heart. They are literally asked to pull up roots, leave lock, stock, and barrel, and risk everything on the goodness of God to a land they've only heard about. Literally, start over. And now they're at the land, the task is to rebuild a godly identity. See, it's one thing to come to the land, but that was never the end. The end was to rebuild the people of God, to rebuild a God-shaped life, to again, to attempt to be a light to the nation, the people that tell a better story. Well, how do you do that? I mean, that's a massive undertaking. And if some of the things we say here are familiar, it's because we just sort of followed the old, slow, tried and true ways of Scripture as best we could to do as these people are doing, and that's produce healthy disciples who love God, love people, and love life. So I'm going to read this text, and, and, and just be honest with you, we don't really see anything new, uh, but we're reminded of something rooted in ancient wisdom, Ezra 3. I'm going to just start out reading the first few verses. Hear God's word. When the seventh month came and the children of Israel were in the towns, the people gathered as one man to Jerusalem. Then arose Joshua, the son of Josedek, with his fellow priest, Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, with his kinsmen. And they built the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offers on it, offerings on it, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. They set the altar in its place for fear was on them because of the peoples of the land and they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord burnt offerings morning and evening this is the word of the Lord thanks be to God let's pray father in heaven we are so glad we can call you father we're so glad that you name us your children your treasured possession it is a mystery to us because most of the time we're not much to be proud of. But in your great mercy, you have made us your own. And in your fierce love, you're making and remaking us into the kind of people who will reflect, albeit in an imperfect way, something of your glory. Father, meet us today as we too, like your ancient people, must rebuild Remind us of who you are and thus who we are. Incomplete and foolish until we find our identity and rest in you. Give us courage in the days ahead to bring our grief, our loss, our shame, our guilt, our fears, and our loneliness to you. As we see here, Father, meet us over the sacrifice. Show us Jesus living and dying to make all things new. Convince us you can write a better story and often do it in the trash heap of our sin and shame. Give us all the resources we need to heal and be made new. 
Grant us, Father, pre patience to be present with those who suffer the most grievous of in injuries. And may this be a place of healing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the story of the exile really is our story because we too are not home yet. Peter in the New Testament likens the people of God, uh, this newly fledgling church of God's family, he calls them sojourners and exiles. And just like God's ancient people, the church of Jesus Christ is in the words of T.S. Eliot. And this is true in the history of the church, in the history from Adam and Eve on, this sort of be, is the rhythm. He says, the church must be forever building for it is forever decaying within and attacked from without. Much to cast down, much to build, much to restore. So here we find ourselves a lot of ways like the people of God in our text not, not just because of the recent news of this last week, but also in a larger scale of just the total disruption of the whole world that we're experiencing. Everywhere you look is disruption. Not just COVID, but the total deterioration of moral and civic life. A Friday morning, I was reading um, an article in the New York Times from David Brooks called America is Falling Apart at the Seams. And he says this, and he's not being melodramatic. He's just kind of quoting different sources. Uh, and he says this. He said, nothing, uh, he, he's saying nothing we don't see or sense. He says this, the number of altercations on airplanes has exploded. The murder rate is surging in cities. Drug overdoses are increasing. Americans are drinking more. Nurses say patients are getting more abusive, and so on and so on. Schools have seen an increase in both minor incidents like students talking in class and more serious issues like fights and gun possession. This is not even to mention the deteriorating climate that are, that are hard to qualify. The rise of polarization, hatred, anger, fear. When I went to college, lo, these many years ago, I never worried that I might say something in class that would utterly get me ostracized. But now the college students, I know that fear that one erratic sentence would lead to social death. That is a monumental sea change. Now, as I said, that's not melodramatic. He's just sort of exegeting the cultural moment. He goes on. What the hell is going on? The short answer, I don't know. I also don't know what's causing the high rates of depression, suicide, and loneliness that dogged Americans even before the pandemic and they're the sad flip side of all the hostility and recklessness I've just described. But there must also be some spiritual and moral problem at the core of this. Over the past several years and over a wide range of different behaviors, Americans have been acting in fewer pro-social and relational ways, more anti-social and self-destructive ways. But why? As a columnist, I'm supposed to have answers. I just don't right now. I just know the situation is dire. That's sort of real. What, what do we do? What, 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 what do we do? What, whatever we do, whatever we believe, let me say this with judgment day honesty. Our faith must be deep enough to handle the toughest realities that, God, that can be thrown at us. This is not a Pollyanna thing. Because if not, what do we do? Are we just like Chicken Little? Every time things get hard, we scream, the sky is falling. When we face the hard facts of deterioration, just think about the words of Ernest Becker at a time like this. He says, I think that taking life seriously means something like this, that whatever man does on this planet has to be done in the lived truth of the terror of creation, of the grotesque, of the rumble of panic underneath everything. Otherwise, it is false. We have to have a belief deep enough 
to handle even the grotesque. Our faith must be constructed on a foundation that recognizes the terror, the rumble of panic, and can face it even in our tears. Now, in our text, Israel is back in the land, enemies within, enemies without. What do they do? How are they going to reshape a God-shaped life? For us, a Christian identity. Well, we see it in our text, and here's what they do. Here's what they do, and we'll contextualize it for our own uses. They rebuilt the altar. They lived out the liturgical calendar, and they laid the foundations of the temple. Sound familiar or abstract? Let me show you. They rebuilt the altar. So the ninth month came, and the children of Israel in the town, the people gathered as one man in Jerusalem. There arose uh, Joshua, the son of jo Josedek, with his fellow priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, with his kinsmen. And they built the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. They set the altar in its place, for fear was on them because of the peoples of the land, and they offered burnt offerings to the Lord, burnt offerings morning and evenings. Now, now for, for, for Cyrus, this is for the fulfillment of political ends, return and rebuild. The leadership of Israel knows that there is something much deeper, and we see wisdom here. Getting back guarantees them nothing. So what if they just became prosperous pagans in their homeland? What if they just have the cultural shapings and formalities without the real thing? No, no. The priority is to shape a God-shaped life, a God-shaped identity. So here's what they do. They build back the first thing is the altar. Not only that, the scripture says they are guided by Scripture. They looked into the law of Moses. Scripture shaped their priority and practice. You say, why is that such a big deal? Well, why is this first? Why is this more important than the temple or the feast? Here's why. Here's why. God meets his people over the sacrifice. Long before tabernacle and temple, long before elaborate prayer books and vestments and psalters, all the way back in the primeval forming of faith, there is the altar. Why? What in the heck does that mean? Offers, all, well, altars are about two things. Burnt offering, atonement, and thanksgiving, offerings of thanksgiving. God is forming his people into a kingdom of priests. And for God's people, all formation begins over the sacrifice. It begins with atonement. The reminder that God comes to them and loves them and us at great cost. For us to be acceptable, to know his great love and mercy, blood is shed. This is true in the New Testament as well. It was all pointing to the New Testament. Everything for us starts at the cross. We aren't loved because of any practices that we do, but because of Jesus' practice. Jesus' died death on the cross. We aren't loved because of anything we do, but because of Jesus met us at the atonement. Jesus lived the life we couldn't, and he died on the cross, a death we deserved. Now, this is true. From Genesis 3, there's the altar. God kills an animal for Adam and Eve's sin. Then we see when God calls Abraham. This is way before the giving of the law. God, off, Abraham offers burnt offerings, builds altars everywhere of thanksgiving and worship to formalize, and finally there's the formalization of the altar in the tabernacle and temple. Central to Israel, 
is we serve a God of grace. A God who reminds us of his mercy at the altar of sacrifice. It's the last thing that's on our lips when we leave here. No matter what may have been said by the preacher, no matter what guilt and shame you might be entering into, no matter how you may be triggered, the last word is Jesus, life and death on the cross, the gospel. He loves you because of what he did, not because of how good or poor your life is. And now this is how God comes near. He comes near through the blood of Jesus. Now, they remind, remember this. Every pagan offered sacrifices to keep the gods away because they're mad. They keep them away and appease them. But for Israel, the sacrifice brings God near. Like Israel coming back again and again. We come back again and again to the cross. You see how powerful that is? For the first time in 70 years, or somewhat less than that, Israel is sort of put back in their story, visibly, powerfully. You see the wisdom in that. For us, for them, see, when, when, when trouble hits, when lamentation is our language and suffering is our food, where do we look? We look at the ancient foundation. What reminds us to put no confidence in men or princes? The sacrifice. We're loved because God made us lovable by his sacrifice. It's all grace. In our brokenness, we hear from the cross, no matter what we, done, we have done, God's mercy can cover it. In our anger, as much as it might be, God's righteous anger fell on Jesus and it can cover you. In our deepest, deepest hurt, God cares so much that he would rather suffer and absorb that hurt than keep you away. And it's here at the cross we also offer sacrifice and acknowledge mercy. Going down in verse 5, we read that. And after the regular burnt offerings, the offerings at noon and all the appointed festivals of the Lord and the, and, and the offerings of everyone who made a free will offering to the Lord. That's somebody is just saying, thanks. That's somebody acknowledging at the altar, coming with thanksgiving. Freely giving back praise and thanksgiving. And that's what we see here. That's what we see here at this, this place God is weakly throwing a party in our midst as we bring our brokenness and sin, our failings and fears, and acknowledge it's covered. And because of that indebtedness and mercy, even through our tears, we come with thanksgiving. We come, even if we're weeping, with the stated joy, knowing that behind it all, the anchor holds. Our life story is profoundly shaped by the story at the altar and a world falling apart. It allows us to live a better story, a God-shaped story. God formed Abraham at the altar. He constituted Israel with the sacrifice of atonement in the first exodus. In the second exodus, he's doing it again. He's constituting them a worship people. As Derek Thompson says, foregoing the benefits of a comfortable bed and a roof over their head, the returning exiles stopped everything you know, in order to acknowledge the hand of God in their otherwise fragile lives. That's why we run to the cross. It's so powerful. It tells us repeatedly when we think, it's too much. My sin's too great. It tells us, no, no, you are. The cross is saying, you're, no, no, you're worse than you thought. I got that. It's so bad, Jesus came. But it also is screaming, don't you see your love beyond belief always? This is the first thing in rebuilding a godly identity. We're the people of grace. We live because of grace and forgiveness. We cannot save ourselves and live in a constant, we live in a constant state of repentance and brokenness, a constant state of faith in God's good mercy and the joy that flows from that center. 
First things first. That's why we say grace is everything. That's why we keep, we, we, we keep going back to the gospel. But secondly, they lived out the liturgical calendar. So immediately after that, we read this. And they kept the feast of booths, as it is written, and offered the daily burnt offerings by number according to the rule, as each day required. And after that, the regular burnt offerings, the offerings of the new moon, and all the appointed festivals of the Lord, the offering of everyone who made a freewill offering to the Lord. From the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord. There's so much here, but let's be brief. The second thing they did to form a God-shaped identity was to do the thing that was historically done. They reinstituted the seven feast. This was a yearly round of feasts and festivals that told the story of redemption. Okay, think about it. This is immersive discipleship. This is not a weekend seminar. This is not a virtual experience. This is immersive discipleship. The body is involved. This forms habits and practices that reflect who God is. And I say immersive because Israel shows you that you're not formed only by abstract teaching, not formed in a classroom, but by being immersed with the community around a table. That's where we got this. And around this table, the story of God is continually reenacted. This is Israel's catechism. Feast, this is the way God, say, this is the way God is. Therefore, this is the way my character is formed and who I'm supposed to be. Imagine how profound this is in this new day. I mean, this is a new day. They, they, they have a, they have a, they have a, a, in one sense, a hard stop, okay? You know, a, a lot of people in, 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 the, in here at churches, and this is true of a lot of pastors and my friends, and I say, we can't try anything new. And this, we say, a Presbyterians, you better get it right the first time because you're going to be doing it that way for the next 200 years. I mean, there's been radical failure. I mean, this is a radical opportunity to try something new and novel, I mean, you, don't you think people would be thinking that? I mean, it's been 70 years, and some of the new people who've inherited the sins of their parents must be thinking, do we really want to go back to this? Did that really work? I mean, we have been in a pagan land. We're not even going to do that, but perhaps this is the time for innovation. To bring in, perhaps, let's make this more efficient, more time-saving. But they didn't. They looked at the old paths. They reinstituted the feast. You want me to tell you what the feast really looked like? You want me to really break it down and tell you what it really looks like? Here's what the festivals and feasts of Israel's did, Israel did. They were parties that told a better story. Everybody had festivals. Nobody had festivals like Israel. They are a light they are a new way to party. And here's why. The poor are there. Outsiders are there. Sojourners are there. At, at, at the heart of the festival is the hospitality of God inviting all. Come. Come. Here's people just serving. Come on. Come on. I want you to see how good God is. This is the way we party seven times a year in their yearly ritual. And some of these were long. Their practices, they were practices that flew in the face of their racism, their greed, elitism, and pride. And they were really, we might say, feast of reconciliation because everyone came. There's no kitty table here. Everyone came and heard and in, heard and acted the redemption story of Israel. As Michael Rhodes says, when Yahweh is on the throne, God gave back to us even those gifts we offer to him. Feasting together with such a generous king shaped the Israel's desires, draws their hearts toward the love of God and neighbor. And I would add one more. Because if everybody loves the feast, 
And in, the, and in the context of formation, and this flies in the pace of dour Presbyterianism, feasting is about loving life. God shapes us in ordinary practices. Just look at the story, the feast tale, the Feast of Tabernacles. They're in booths for a week celebrating God's provision in the wilderness. The Feast of Passover is about deliverance from slavery. God's forming in them in this new place to tell a better story to the world and the culture around them. What's, ha- what's changed? Can we do better than that? I'm listening. Believe me, I've been in ministry a long time. I've tried to innovate. I've tried to do the new and the novel. I read the latest journals. I love change. I'd blow stuff up and start all over all the time. My wife wouldn't come and handle that. And nobody on my staff could, and you couldn't either. That's why most church planners plan a church every three years. What's changed? I'll tell you this. I, I, and what, what, what constrains me by Scripture is not just Scripture, but my, looking at my own heart and around me, God has given us tried and true means, habits, practices that scream that we're part of a better story than the cultural story. And even if we live in a freer place in America than most that, that has, has that in, in this really free place, has that really brought us closer to God? I mean, I'm, I'm glad I'm here. I don't want to be anywhere else. But really, has the American myth brought us closer to God, closer to being human, closer to freedom? Brooks dispels that myth. We do these practices like Israel. The habits of grace we talk about, not to get God to love us, but we got Teflon hearts and we're listening to the world's story and we're so easily uh, drawn away. And we, so we engage to be reminded of that we're in a better story, to be reminded of God's love and our whole ministry is built on that. It's not fancy, it's not efficient, it's not fast, it cannot be done virtually. It happens slowly as God forms a shaped life within us. And like the system of feasts and festivals, it's the cross, it, it, it's death, and yet on the other side is resurrection and, and, and new life and abundance and joy. I mean, even here, with these people, look at them. They're a subjugated people. But they're becoming radically free as they live into God's ordering of their life. God is reforming them into his people, essentially through the gospel and specific habits and practices. He keeps reminding them of his love. Now the last thing they did, and very, very quickly because I don't want to spend much time because we're going to talk about the temple. It actually got started here and then it's delayed like 20 years. And Josh will talk about that. They laid the foundations of the temple. From the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer offerings to the Lord, but the foundation of the temple was not yet laid. See, that was not the priority. The altar was the priority. But it was a priority. It was part of the means of grace. So they gave money to the masons, and the carpenters and food and drink and oil to the Sidonians and Tyrrhenians to bring cedar trees from Lebanon to the sea to Joppa according to the grant that they had from Cyrus, king of Persia. This is similar to the way they did this in the old times. There's a continuity here with the past. Now in, the, in, the, in this second year after the coming to the house of God at Jerusalem in the second month, Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Josadak, made a beginning together with the rest of the kinsmen, priests, Levites, and all who had come to Jerusalem from captivity. They appointed the Levites from 20 years old and upwards to supervise the work of the house of the Lord. And Joshua with his sons and his brothers, and, and Cadmiel and his sons, the son of Judah, together supervised the workmen in the house of God along with the sons 
of Herodad and the Levites, their sons and brothers. And when the builders had laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments came forward with trumpets, the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with symbols to praise the Lord according to the directives of David, king of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising, giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures toward Israel. And all the people shouted with great shouts when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites, heads of families, old men who had seen the first house, wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of the house being laid. Their many shouted aloud for joy so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the sh joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping. For the people shouted with a great shout, and the sound was heard from a way off. Now, in the laying of the foundation of the temple, we see God shaping them into a worshiping community. As in the first exodus, worship was their vocation. It was the first thing. Why? Because worship shapes our loves. This is what Brooks doesn't say. It's right here. Here's the cause of our deepest malaise. God made us for himself. Happiness, wholeness, human thriving. All is dictated and starts with what we love. And if, and if, and if we love wrongly, good things become idols. And those good things deform us. I'm not going into detail here, but I just want to close with this one comment. Notice, notice this. Many wept because this is not like the former one. Now, you don't see it in this text, but, Zer but uh, Zechariah rebukes them. He rebukes them. I know it's not as glorious, but he rebukes them because their worship of nostalgia the good old days. How often as a pastor do I hear people from religious places lamenting, oh, if it was just like in the past, rather than rejoicing in small mercies, so bitter they can't see God's mercy before them. Oh, God, give us eyes to see as a people. Listen. Listen, if God sets a table in the wilderness, if God sets a table, period, it's pure grace. Jesus said, if two or three gather, I'm here. Small things, God is in them. God is in them. Now, and with God in the small things, all small things are big things, just like our feast here. Small things, but loaded with meaning, healing, and redemption. The cross always has the last word. So let's go there. There's a prayer of confession in your bulletin. We're going to pray that corporally in one second. Let's just prepare our hearts and confess our own sins, our own brokenness, our own need. And then we will do this together. And now together, Almighty and most merciful Father, we're thankful that your mercy is higher than the heavens, wider than our wanderings, deeper than our sin. Forgive our careless attitudes toward your purposes, our refusal to relieve the suffering of others, our envy of those who have more than we have, our obsession with creating a life of constant pleasure, our indifference to the treasure of heaven our neglect of your wise and gracious law. Help us to change our way of life so that we may desire what is good, love what you love, do what you command. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the words of pardon. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. Amen.
On the night in which the Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body broken for you. I give my life for yours. In the same manner, after supper, he took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for the remission of your sins. Drink this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show forth my death until I come. Remember, I meet you at the sacrifice. Let's pray. Father, take these ordinary means, and may they be for us the body and blood of Jesus. Heal our hearts just a bit, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We do communion by coming forward. There's just grape juice, no wine today, just grape juice and all gluten-free bread. So you'll go to the station that's closest to you, okay? And uh, this is a table for all who know and love the Lord Jesus and are a member of the church. We're glad you're here. You're our guest. Be, come, feel free to come when we come here in a minute. If your children haven't made a profession, bring them, not to take the elements they're not ready, but to be blessed. If you hadn't made a profession, you're quite, not quite ready, but do come and say, I'd just like to talk more. Would love to talk to you. Let's come to the table now.
For a minute there, I thought I was at a Billy Graham revival. You know? Now, the scripture tells us that when they had feasted together, they sang a hymn, and then they went out to serve the world and be a better story in the culture. So let's do that. Let's stand as we conclude our worship. we conclude our worship if you need somebody to pray with you there'll be folk up front we'd love to pray with you uh, if you're new and would like more information meet us in the narthex on the right there's a connect table we'd love to tell you more about what's going on here now receive the benediction restore us O lord god of hosts let your face shine that we may be saved give us life and we will call upon your name go and serve jesus